And well, I was saying that I am a geographer um, working on land issue in the rural spaces in France. And uh, David Flachet asked me to, to speak about land justice and farmland concentration today. Um, so I will try to, to give you some insight about what land concentration is, um, particularly re regarding farmland uh, issues. And in the second part of the, of the session, I'd like to draw your attention on why it could be interesting to analyze land concentration from a land justice perspective. So the idea is to uh, introduce you to, to the um, literature of um, scientific literature about the, the two fields, about the two notions, land concentration and land justice. Um, maybe to start, have you ever heard of that term, land concentration? Does it mean anything to you? No? Will, would someone like to, to try to define it or to give some ideas related to, to the term? Well, the terms are, are linked. The, question, the, 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 the input of your uh, colleague was, is it the same as latifundism? So it, it's linked because both terms relate to how land is distributed uh, between farms. Do you have any other idea? Yes, basically that's the idea of how land is distributed, the ownership or the use of land is distributed between uh, users. Um, it's not the same if you look at ownership or at use of land. We will see it in detail um, in, the, in the following of the session. Um, you may have heard about the, the land concentration through the prism of land grab. Land grabbing was uh, a lot more uh, in the media during the 15 past years. Um, you may have heard about large scale land acquisitions, land grabbing, land deals, land enclosure, or land rush. All those terms relate to the fact that the 21st century um, uh, experiments a new trend in how land is distributed between users, between owners. Um, along the, the, the second half of the 20th century, globally seen uh, at the world scale, there were policies to distribu distribute land in a more um, equitable way, in a more um, equal way. And two tipping points uh, were achieved in the, at, at the beginning of the century. Um, maybe you remember in 2007, a lot of hunger riots in, in more in the global south countries, but in, in, in many countries of, of the world. And the following year, 2008, the finance crisis also fueled the dynamic of um, large-scale land acquisition. Why? The hunger riots put at the top of the political agenda the issue of food security. And if you want to achieve food security for your country, one lever is to control land to produce food. And the finance crisis, uh, actually, it um, gave a new value to farmland. Owning farmland became um, financially uh, quite um, uh, a good asset. So those two uh, events uh, drew uh, again the attention of investors of uh, sovereign countries to land, to farmland. Um, on this map, which is unfortunately uh, in French, I will translate it. Um, you can see the, the countries in uh, red with the most uh, land grabbing or large scale land acquisition deals which were uh, documented uh, since 2007, 2008. You may see that it's not homogeneously uh, distributed um, in the world and that countries from the global south or from the post-Soviet uh, zone are, uh, appear more frequently. The idea is that um, those deals, those large-scale land, land acquisitions, actually benefited from particular land regimes. Um, in Western Europe, in Northern America, most of the land is privately owned by individual persons or by corporations. In the Global South, actually, private individual property is not that present, and mm, the most of the land is owned by uh, the state through different form, 
or um, by um, commons, you, in, in, in forms of commons or collective property of, of, of the land. But there is a lot of um, opportunities for investors to, uh, to ac acquire a large, um, large tracts of land. So South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the post-Soviet era were the main target zones of those uh, land grabbing or large-scale large land acquisitions. Usually, the investor do not um, own the land. Usually, the, the, the control of the land is through long-term concessions. It means that um, on a financial point of view, it's not um, that interesting to own land because you you, you put capital in, in land for a long uh, period of time, and paying a rent is uh, usually uh, the solution which is uh, chosen by investors. So this is land grabbing, large-scale deals uh, who appear in the media, who you, you may have heard of. And um, I don't And you may have heard about it because there is a lot of rallying of advocacy about the, the phenomenon, about land grabbing, which is dis described as uh, a trend uh, which will be uh, regulated, which should be limited. Uh, here, for example, you have the, the, um, uh, a call for action about a, a land grab case in Madagascar, but there is a lot of other one. Actually, the, um, if you want to learn more about the, the precise uh, cases, you could uh, look at the Land Matrix, which is a non-profit organization, uh, which aim is to collect data about large-scale land acquisitions, about land deals, and to, uh, to give some tools to, um, to describe the deals, the tendency. Here I just uh, take an example of all deals concerning uh, land situated in Ethiopia. And you have the, 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 pro the, the countries uh, where the investors are situated. So in UK, North Macedonia, uh, USA, Canada, etc., etc. And in the case of Ethiopia, only one deal uh, with Ethiopian investors is represented uh, with land in Mozambique. So the land, the, the land matrix uh, nowadays uh, monitor uh, all the, the, the land grabbing cases, and they have more than 2,000 which are documented. Not only the global south is uh, concerned by land grabbing, by uh, large-scale land acquisitions. Here I'd like to draw your attention about the, the Canadian case. Um, it's a case which is uh, largely documented because uh, colleagues from the Saskatchewan province worked uh, a lot about it. And they also show that uh, following a deregulation of the land market in Saskatchewan, um, investors um, came to the, to the farmland market and bought a lot of, uh, of uh, land plots. Well, the maps are not that readable, but if you want to, to learn more about it, uh, you could follow the, um, the reference. They mapped the, the extent of corporate ownership of land uh, before the, the deregulation of farmland market and after the deregulation. Land grab not, um, is not only uh, related to foreign investment. In the case of Saskatchewan, it was the pension plan of uh, Canadian renters who entered uh, the farmland market to, um, to, to buy a lot of plots to be able to pay the rent to, to Canadian um, uh, renters. Um, what is interesting is that new, new kind of investors uh, developed in, 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 the, in the province, in the Saskatchewan province, after the deregulation. Here, um, it's a, a screen capture of a video of Angelic Land. Angelic Land is a Canadian-based co company who buy a large tract of land, um, who try to uh, transform them to make them more able to be farmed, and then who rent them to, to farmers. Um, on the map here, you can see the, the little blue and white um, squares, which are the uh, ownership, the land owned by Angelique. And here, there is um, 
22,000 acres near Yorktown, a city in Saskatchewan, uh, which are offered to be rented. 22,000 uh, acres, it's quite a large uh, amount of land. And, and this developed, this flew, fueled the evolution of agriculture from a family-oriented agriculture towards a corporate-oriented agriculture. Since the beginning, I'm uh, talking about who owns land, uh, investors who buy land. This was actually the main concern of people um, uh, working about land grabbing, about large-scale land acquisitions during the 15 first years of the phenomenon. Let's say since the beginning, 2007, 2008. But as I said just previously, um, when you have to farm so large tract of land, actually the, the, the agricultural model evolves. It's not more uh, a family farming, it's more and more a corporate farming. What does it mean, the difference between family farming and corporate farming? Maybe you know it. Could you be able to define what family farming could be and what corporate farming refers to? Yes? So family farming would uh, deal more with like subsistence agriculture wherein uh, you just want to um, sustain yourself and maybe if you have a surplus you could sell it in the market but it's not oriented towards surplus. Whereas for corporate farming it's like predefined crops that you would be growing for selling in the market. It is predominantly market based. And that's a, uh, a good point but there, uh, actually what you introduced, the model of subsistence farming um, can be differentiated from family farming. Um, you wanted to, to, to give some complementary ideas? Family, family farming is when the tillers of the soil are the owners as well. And cooperative farming is when the, a bunch of people who do not own land, but they unite, and then they start farming on a common land, and then they share the output among themselves. Um, yes, you, you spoke about cooperative farming. I was speaking about corporate farming. Um, um, actually, um, I don't know if anyone has any input he, he or she would like to, to give. Well, family farming, family farming is when a family uh, basically controls the three factors of production of, farm, uh, of farming. What are the three production factors of farming? Land, labor, and capital. When the, the member of the same family control uh, the capital, have access to land, and are the main people working on the farm, we call it family farming. It can be uh, market-oriented, as you said just before, or subsistence-oriented. The idea of, the, tr of the, um, the twist from family farming to corporate farming is that corporate farming means that a corporation or a company controls the three production factor. So a corporation, not a family, has access to land, uh, gives the capital which is necessary to farm, and employs uh, people to do the work on, on the farm. When you are a family, during family farming, usually the way uh, land is controlled, access to land is um, controlled, is quite simple. When you go to family f to f corporate farming, what is um, interesting is that complex corporate st structure are usually uh, developing. Here is um, a figure just representing who controls the land of three farms. It's a lot of um, of boxes um, with names of companies of people and. The link between farmland and people, physical people, is mediated through corporate uh, structures, through companies. And that's why uh, more and more in the scientific literature, the question is not to know who owns or uses land, but what owns land, with the idea that complex corporate structure um, actually own land and not more uh, physical persons. 
So land grabbing goes hand in hand with um, the evolution of farming, from family farming to corporate farming, but also with the evolution of our relation to land, which is more and more mediated through uh, companies and complex corporate st structure. Well, I'm speaking about land grabbing for, uh, for the, be the beginning of the session, but if you look at the picture of how land is dis distributed in the world, land grabbing cases are really impressive because, wow, uh, 30,000 acres change from uh, uh, peasants' communities to uh, cooperation from other countries. This is something very impressive. This is something which appears in the media. But there is a trend which is more discreet, but which concerns more land. And this trend is land concentration. The, as, the, the idea that less and less people control land, and if less and less people control the same amount of land, uh, actually, any, each people, each farm, uh, farm a larger amount of land. Um, why is this a problem? And this paper argues that um, land concentration is just as problematic as land grabbing because it uh, leads to the, the loss of small farms, to the marginalization of small farms, because it benefits to larger farms. And that it, it also has a consequence in terms of what we call denial of entry to prospective farmers. The idea that if you have less and less people farming the land, well, the new uh, uh, wave of people who want to go back to land, to farm um, in agroecological practices and so on, have uh, meet a lot of hurdles to enter the, the farmland market. Um, here, I'd like to draw your attention on the two maps on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. The first represents the, um, the share of the agricultural surface, which is uh, farmed by small farms, uh, meaning farms with less than five hectares. Um, if the color is uh, red, it means that small farms uh, farm a very, very little amount of, la uh, of land, a very little share of the land. If the color is blue, it means that small farms farm more than the half of the of their agricultural land. What you can see at the European scale is that mm, uh, the countries of uh, Eastern Europe, like Romania, the south of Poland, Lithuania, Croatia, Gr uh, Greece, still have uh, uh, an agricultural landscape which is dominated by small farms, whereas in France, in the, let's say in Western or Northern Europe, small farms are literally marginalized from the agricultural landscape. They farm less than 1% uh, of the agricultural land. So this trend of land concentration um, is actually w was actually fueled by the, the common agricultural policy and that is something that we can see on the map. It um, encouraged uh, small and, uh, and middle-sized farm to enlarge and to become uh, la larger farms. But also in former um, communist country like uh, Czechia or Slovakia, you have cases of very, very large farms. In Czechia, the, the, in some, co in some uh, provinces, the medium size of farm is 600 hectares, so 10 times uh, what we know in France. Maybe in, in I'll take five or 10 minutes to, to give some, some details about the, the, the French situation, to give you more concrete idea about what farm, uh, land concentration is. And on this figure, you can see the number of farms from 1970 to 2020. So it was uh, divided by four. And here, the, um, the medium area of each farm, which was um, multiplied by three, that five. We have a, a very mathematical trend. We have four times less farms than uh, 50 years um, ago. And each of our farm in France is three to f four times uh, bigger. 
this trend is um, should continue. Uh, here it's um, a provision done by the Ministry of Agriculture. But interestingly enough, if you look at the Gini uh, coefficient of the repartition of land between farms, it looks quite stable, as if all the farms were enlarging at the same pace, and as if uh, land concentration was not uh, really a problem. On this map, you can see the, um, from 1970 to 2020, um, the evolution of the medium size of farms in France, when it's uh, green, uh, farm, farms are um, small, and it, when it's orange to red, farms are uh, big. As you can see, um, the, the region, the farming region around Paris, which is called the Bassin Parisien, with a lot of cereals, uh, was already in the 1970s a region with la larger farms. It's also the case of um, the semi-arid mountains uh, of uh, Aveyron and Lozère. And the trend is farms enlarging all over the time. Why should it be a problem? Well, if you look at how diverse the production are within each farm. Well, the trend is that farms are specializing. In 1970, farms could have four to five different production within the same farm. Like, I don't know, uh, poultry, um, um, cereals, um, apples, and whatever you want. When your farm becomes larger, you're looking for scale economies, so you're looking on focusing on one production and making it, making it efficient. So one consequence of land concentration is the specialization of farm. On, the, uh, on an agronomic farm, if you look at the agronomy, um, it, wa it was meaningful that farms had a lot of different production on, 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 on the estate. Uh, because it's more resilient, because uh, the manure of the, um, of the cows is helpful uh, to grow your, your cereals, and so on, and so on. So special, specialization uh, comes from scale economies, um, which are a consequence from land concentration. The other consequence is agricultural depopulation. On those two maps, you can see um, the density of agricultural workers in France between 1970 and 2020. What you can see is that when you are looking for scale economies, you need less labor and you depopulate the rural ter territories, at least the agricultural um, part of it. This trend of land uh, concentration um, also benefits to the largest farms. This is may maybe something <laughs> you, you already understood, but um, this figure uh, shows it uh, very well. It's a case study made in Normandy um, by a colleague of Caen. And farms were uh, sorted out uh, regarding the, their size in 2007. And the colleague uh, just looked at uh, the land transfer between farms between 2007 and 2013. And what you can see is that the only two groups of farms who enlarge at the ben at the, um, are the 20% uh, uh, of the largest farms. Here is their um, amount of land at the beginning and here their amount of land at the end. So you may heard Mm, the, the majority uh, farming uh, union in France saying, well, land concentration is not a problem because there is um, no uh, gr growth of inequalities between farms. They all um, uh, enlarge, and uh, that's what we call, uh, that's what we call uh, agricultural modernization. But what the data show is that actually the biggest farm um, marginalize the, the smallest one and uh, um, and also have uh, um, uh, influenced the market by this denial of entry phenomenon I spoke about. There are also uh, landscape and environment consequences. Um, the same case study in Normandy uh, focused on what is actually in the landscape the consequences of land concentration. So the colleagues uh, took a case study in a, in a dairy region with a lot of uh, 
um, of uh, grassland, as you can see on the, on the photograph. The trend is that um, there is less and less grassland and more and more cereals. How to explain this? If you look at the map here, the colleagues uh, mapped in red the plots which are the, the, the union, the fusion of more than three uh, plots. In orange, the plots that are the fusion, the, the union of two plots during uh, the period they, they, they studied. So around a third of the, of the plots were unified during the period. What is the consequence of this? When you look for scale economies, well, you unified the production. Here, as an, uh, as an example, you had four plots with grassland, uh, orchards, and cereals. And at the end of the period, um, there is only cereal in, the, in this plot, which, which was actually um, unified. Um, another consequence is that all the trees which were used to del delimitate the, the plots were uh, also um, uh, dripped out of the, of the landscape. Um, well, this uh, issue of land concentration, as I said, is more discrete than la land grabbing, but also more diverse uh, regarding the different countries where it um, happens. If we look at the consequences in the literature, as I said, it simplifies the production models at the cost of ecological practices. It homogenizes landscapes. Um, it also transforms the demographical trends. It reduces the, the resilience of food systems. Um, it has a role in deteriora deteriorating soil quality and it impacts family farming. With all those consequences which, were, uh, which are um, um, fr um, studied, um, a debate uh, arises uh, about what should be done against land concentration. Um, at the world scale, at the EU scale, some texts uh, were issued. Uh, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2000, 2012 issued um, voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure, but this text is only about for the people who want to do things better. There is no regulation. Um, in the same uh, idea, in 2018, the United Nations issued a declaration on peasants' rights, but um, it doesn't create a new regulation to, um, to, to regulate the trends. At the EU level, um, uh, many organizations from the, from the civil society, from peasants' organization, tried to make uh, a lot of agenda-setting work, a lot of um, advocacy work, to make the EU uh, think about uh, taking a regulation about farmland concentration. Uh, uh, reports were issued by the European Parliament. Um, the European Commission uh, answered that actually land issues are um, national issues and that uh, the, the, the European Union was not responsible for it. And in 2000, 2024, uh, at last, in the, in the strategic dialogue on the future of EU agriculture, there is the idea of creating a European farmland observ observatory just to know if there is land concentration, what is the trend, and so on. But still no uh, clue about taking a regulation to regulate land concentration. Um, just to give you uh, a final uh, idea about um, what it is, I like to speak about uh, a case in Romania. Uh, here is an extract of the map um, of the eastern part of Romania. You have Bucharesti, the, um, the Dark Sea here. Here is Ukraine, Moldavia, Bulgaria. So it's a large um, share of the country. And here within the, the black circle, you have uh, an island within the, the Danube which is an island, um, it's 60 kilometers long and 20 kilometers on the other side. So it's quite a big island. It's called Insula Maria Abrailei. And 
um, before uh, the, the, the 1960s, this island was only marshland. It was drained and irrigated by the communist regime. And all the island is farmed by only one farm, which is, um, uh, initially it was a Romanian farm, but it was um, sell, sold to uh, Emirates uh, capital in 2018. And it's like a, a new land created in the 1960s, which are now, which is now uh, only found by the wine farm. Um, it's along the, the Danube, so it's easy then to export the, the cereals, the crops, um, towards the grains, towards uh, the Middle East, um, through the, um, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. In the Eastern Europe, actually, there were a, a lot of uh, movements towards uh, land concentration and regulation of land markets. Um, in the interwar period, after the, the new states uh, were created, after uh, 1918, the, uh, the, the, the starting situation was that land was uh, owned and uh, farmed by large noble estates uh, of the former Russian Empire, of the former um, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the, n the new states tried to, to create family farming by uh, redistributing the land of those estates. Um, the red redistribution trend continued just after the war, but during um, the Stalinian decade, we observed a reconcentration of land through the form of Kolkos and Sovkos, the state farm and the cooper cooperative farms. After 1990, um, the new democratic states tried to redistribute land again to farmers. But corporate farming uh, developed in those countries, and now we can observe corporate estates, which are usually um, on the same location as the state and cooperative estates of the communist period, which were usually at the same locations that the noble agrarian estates of uh, before First World War. And in France, why? Why did we speak about uh, land concentration? Um, in the past 15 years, there were three land affairs. Um, the first one, maybe you heard about it because it's the most um, known one. Um, there were a, a project in northern France, near uh, in the Picardy, to create a so-called thousand cows farm. And a lot of demonstrations uh, took place to, to, to denounce this. The second example is um, evoked by this uh, photomontage. Um, in 2015, 2016, in the media appeared the, the, the fact that Chinese, mysterious Chinese investors were buying land in the center of France. Actually, they didn't buy more than 3,000 hectares, which is quite a, a big amount of land, but not um, that's enormous. And it, it helped a lot of uh, stakeholders to put this, uh, this uh, issue of land concentration on the top of the political agenda. And two years ago, the, there was a last offer with um, a large farm, uh, farming more than 2,000 hectares, uh, which was sold um, to only three, three farmers. And it's, it gave uh, room to a lot of contestations of uh, such a, a large farm. Um, in parallel, during the, the, the 15 past years, the 10 past years, um, there were in France uh, a lot of agenda-setting work about regulating farmland uh, markets. Um, when I present to, to colleagues uh, from outside France the way markets are reg regulated in France, um, they usually answer, oh, but you're a communist country still. Um, why? Just because in France we have um, an institution which is called SAFER, um, and SAFER have, has the right to preempt any uh, land which is sold in France, any farmland, any forest land. It means that um, SAFER are here meant in France to uh, regulate the prices of land, to be sure that there is no uh, land speculation, and they are also here to be sure that um, investors from outside the farmland sector don't invest too much in agriculture. And this has uh, a very uh, concrete consequence that 
farmland or um, the, way, the, the medium price of farmland in France is 6,000 euro per hectare. And in the Netherlands, in northern Italy, it's 60,000 euro per hectare. Another consequence is that 80% of land, of farmland in France, is owned by farmers or their families um, or people linked to the agricultural sector. Um, but just a question, if you want to, to become a farmland owner uh, today, how would you do? You have an idea, I'm sure. Uh, take out a very large loan. Um, okay, why not? <laughs> Any other idea? How do you concretely do to find the, the plot of, of land you want to become an owner? Find an old farmer and take over? Hmm? <laughs> it could be an idea. And, and let's say you found your old farmer uh, who wants to take over. How, uh, on a legal b um, point of view, how do you do to, to become the owner of the, of the land? <laughs> In Germany, you can uh, set up a company to buy the, um, the, the, the land for you, then you don't have to pay uh, property taxes to when, you're like when you buy it. Actually, yes, usually in France, if you want to become the owner of, of, of land, statistically, more um, surfaces of land are sold through the sale of company shares of company owning land. So statistically in France, more land is uh, change uh, the people who control them, not because you just sold a tract of land, uh, a plot, but because you, you sold the shares of your company and actually your company owns land. This is uh, another consequence of the rise of corporate farming. More and more land is owned by uh, corporation companies and not by private individuals. Well, Safer doesn't uh, have any role in the farming market because the right of preemption of Safer is when you uh, sell a plot of land, not when you sell shares of companies. During all the decades, the idea was how can we regulate in France the market, which is a, f a farmland market, but a new farmland market of the shares of companies owning farmland. So I'm not entering the details, but uh, at the end, um, the, the French uh, National Assembly creates a new administrative uh, authori authorization if you want to sell uh, the shares of your company owning farmland, you have to ask the permission to suffer. And they are here to, to be sure that no mega farm is um, developing. Okay, this was the, the, um, the first part of my speech. As I am speaking alone, maybe I speak, I'm speak. i speaking too much. It's fifth, uh, 20 past five. Well, do you have any qu question, maybe, uh, before we are uh, going to the second part of the session about land justice? Yes. What's the data availability like in France? Because I've like very briefly worked on this in Germany, and there it's like it's really bad. Like there's one guy who's trying to estimate it, but like there's like land ownership, there's nothing basically. Um. In all the EU, there is um, uh, a few years ago a, a directive about um, uh, well, I, d I don't know how to say it in English, but um, a directive who uh, force forces every uh, member state to have a, a register of the people who effectively benefit from companies. Um, oh. Oh, in France you can uh, for research, um, <laughs> but it's true that um, the the registered uh, was first open to uh, everyone, then closed, uh, then reopened, and then closed again. But for research, it, it, it's opened. Um, 
and you can um, you can map the, all those relations. And we have also um, from INSEE, from our National St Statistical Institute, um, there is a register of the financial links between uh, companies, um, which can be uh, consulted. I don't know if you have the same in Germany. Or <laughs> Um, but I read uh, recently a report made by um, a, a government agency of Germany, I don't know the name, about that kind of... Okay. <laughs> but just uh, do your case study about France. <laughs> um, any other question before we, we go to Langesis? Um, I was wondering <coughs> what the sort of is the, are there also metrics on like the wealth of these farmers because what I know from the Dutch context is that farmers are like most likely of all people to be millionaires and sometimes I find this discussion about like farmers therefore a little bit twisted in the sense that I'm like okay you have all these assets and you would be able to also like change the way you're operating or change your like like the size of your land if you really wanted to and that's more like a a power grab so to say there are data about the you know the the, the subsidies from the cap that farmers uh, get in Fra in france it's open to everyone i don't know in, in the netherlands but um, it's called telepack and you enter just the name of the farm and you know how much money they got during the past two uh, campaigns of uh, CAP subsidies, and for which um, for which reason they they got it? Um, so, um, for instance, there is a, a payment for the small farms in France. It's for the farms until 52 hectares, and as this payment is proportional to the size, if the farm is smaller than 52 hectares, you can calculate the the very precise uh, size of the farm uh, based on this payment. Um, you can know if they got the payment for organic agriculture and so on and so on. But it's not about the, the wealth, it's about the, the fluxes of money they got. Well, all, um, what I said in the first part about um, the rise of corporate farming, uh, facing f uh, family farming, um, makes that uh, justice issues appear in the public debate in France uh, regarding um, different types of farm. Uh, the first uh, is that there is um, the farmland regulation uh, doesn't uh, apply to farm statuses. Uh, in the same way, if you are an individual farm, you, your transmission of the farm is regulated by the right of prevention of SAFER. So from the first hectare, you're regulated by SAFER. If you are a, 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 farming, a, um, a corporate farm, then you can um, uh, pass to uh, a new farmer without uh, the same control as um, SAFER control the, the market of uh, shares of company owning farmland, um, but with um, but only for the for the biggest farms. There is a lot of uh, exclusion cases. Um, justice issues are also raising about um, the the fact that different farming models doesn't have the same access to land. Uh, as we say, as we said, uh, land concentration. Um, benefits for to the farms who um, uh, have enfin, look who are looking for a farm uh, for scale economies. So the small farms, the small the, the farms in organic agriculture, the farm with agroecological um, practices feel uh, the most of the time excluded from the land market. And there is also just this uh, issue about farmers' profiles coming from the farming sector or not. Um, here you have two photographs from a um, uh, demonstration from uh, farmers, uh, which are from a farming union called uh, the, the, the Peasants' Confederation, member of um, an umbrella organization called La, La Via Campesina. Um, and 
this farming union is more on the left side, let's say. And here on the T-shirt, you can see uh, three little, three small farms, or better than one big farm. And here, um, the the it's called installer plutôt qu'à grandir. So um, it's better to uh, give the opportunity to new farmer uh, to create their business. Um, more than uh, giving the opportunity to uh, already big farmers to become bigger. All this uh, issue of justice between farm statuses, farming models, farmer profiles, they refer to um, two terms, in English land justice and in France justice foncière. Um, well, justice foncière actually doesn't appear a lot. Uh, it's more a legal and technical term uh, that we can see in some uh, publication in planning, in law history, and in, in the French scientific literature is more applied to the, the global south. Um, but land justice in the anglophone sp sphere is really a more central concept to analyze the inequities of repartition of land between users. Uh, first of all, land justice uh, is an activist slogan, as you can see on, on this photograph um, in the United States, in Canada, in Scotland, in many English-speaking countries, land justice is a motto um, and that has a real an existence in the social world. Um, it's, a, it's a concept which uh, includes all the dimension of land, the physical dimension, but also the, the symbolic uh, relationship to land and, and territory. Um, looking at the, at, the, um, at the scientific literature, um, we can see that land justice appears in publication uh, studying four major transformations of land structures. The first is settler colonia colonialism, uh, mostly in the, in, the, in the USA, in Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, and other uh, UK dominions, but also in Chile. The, the second major transformation of land structure, which is addressed uh, through a land justice lens is uh, apartheid in South Africa or in some publications in Palestine. The third one is warfare, warfare uh, with the, the particular case of Colombia, with a lot of peasants we were, which were, who were uh, displaced during decades of, uh, of war. And there is a, 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 a rise of work uh, about land justice in the global south uh, addressing the issue of land grabbing of the new enclosure, the new land en enclosures. So, this notion of land justice is twofold. It's a motto used by um, social movements to ask for a better re um, distribution of lands um, in developed countries. It's also um, a, a, a theoretical lens used to, um, to analyze how land, uh, land structure, land repartition is um, totally um, uh, transformed by uh, colonialism, apartheid, land grabbing, warfare, etc. Um, in the case of settler colonialism, uh, the study um, based on, land just on a land justice issue um, uh, starts from the point of view that land was stolen by um, by newcomers, uh, that land was uh, that people uh, using land were uh, marginalized, were um, um, that their land to that their rights to land were abused. Um, so land justice, this lens of analysis of land justice, combines the idea of right to territory for indigenous people and the idea of right to land for the peasants. Uh, community. Um, regarding land justice, the, the United States appear uh, as a paragon case because there is a lot of scholars in the United States, but also because um, a lot of trends um, uh, impacting uh, strongly the distribution of land can be observed. Um, well, since the, the 17th century, um, the, the European land institutions were imported to, to, to what would become the U United States. And uh, some authors like McClintock analyze it as a primitive accumulation of capital through dispossession. Um, 
people looking more at the distribution now of land uh, uh, analyze the constraints which are imposed by uh, the patriarchal and the racist uh, organization of land institution. And, and some others uh, look more at uh, the fact that individual private property, which was imposed um, in face of collective uh, use rights uh, on land, are uh, accompanied by uh, a lot of violence. This notion of land justice, as I said, has a, a very strong memorial component, and it's used by um, a social movement from the African-American uh, African communities, the um, uh, indigenous communities, to address the idea that um, uh, um, slavery, genocide, the theft of indigenous land has to be um, addressed through reparations, and one kind of repression could be uh, that land uh, ownership or land use right could be uh, um, given back to those communities. It's also uh, a lens to critically approach the back to the land movement, the idea that people from big cities, usually from Caucasian um, uh, origin, uh, want to, to farm uh, um, and to create uh, farm businesses. But uh, uh, some authors uh, just recall that um, farming in the United States, it, is, it means farming in, a, in, 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 um, in the context of settler colonialism, and that uh, it means farming on stolen land. If, we, if I want to sketch a bit the, the different di dimensions of um, justice and injustice regarding land, land justice um, can be defined as, if we look at all the, 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 the scientific re reports and uh, papers, land justice is defined as the equitable and inclusive access to land and its resources for all farmers and all aspiring farmers. Um, to understand this, uh, this figure, maybe it's good to, to go back to the social justice theories. Do you, do you have any mm, idea about the social justice theories, what they say about what is fair, actually? If you want to, 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 to say that the situation is fair, which is the criteria you're looking at? It depends on, it depends on the theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you maybe <laughs> 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 like the traditional theories are the utilitarianism or the uh, equalitarian theory or and what or the um, regarding land if you start from these theories uh, if you want to have an utilitaristic approach uh, it doesn't really matter who owns the land as far as uh, the condition of no one worsens, but like some can like gain from land concentration without any other loss, let's say. Mm -hmm. An equalitarian perspective instead tends to uh, give all of uh, landowners or workers the same rights and benefits from mm -hmm. the land, I guess. Well, the we can see that those are really different pathways about yeah, uh, yeah. what will be fair uh, regarding land distribution. Um, do you have in mind other justice theories, social justice theories, which could be applied to land distribution issues? Anyone? I don't know if this is actually a theory, but I think when it comes to land distribution and maybe many other concepts as well, but uh, the concept of uh, equality and equity is very important because when we think about the land distribution, we think should it be more um, uh, on the basis of equality where everybody gets it despite what are the dimensions they have like or should we think more in terms of equity where we prioritize one group of people over the another based on some aspects again mm -hmm. yes uh, it's right to say that equality and equity are not the same and that there are social justice theories related to the to both terms i think there's also retributive theory and redistributive theory mm -hmm. 
if I'm not wrong. And retributive talks about like making things right and in a way like reparations up to some extent, like retributions. You pay for what you did. And I think redistributive would be similar to distributive, so I'm not sure. Well, it's true that th there, there is also the idea that um, something fair um, should take uh, in consideration what happened before, as you said about redistribu redistributive. Well, um, just to give you uh, a first level of detail, um, social justice theories, um, there is a first bundle of them saying what is fair is the result, uh, when we look at the result, how land is distributed between users, between owners, um, is it fair from diverse criteria? A second bunch of theories says, oh, the result is important, but also the way, the, 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 the way we did to, to come to that result. So, and did the process to distribute land was actually also fair or not? And a third group of theories says, mm, okay, uh, it's nice to, to look at the, the process, but um, when we did the process, um, did we really recognize all the visions of the resource of land which uh, exist between people? And did we recognize that every profile of farmer had uh, the same dignity to uh, uh, voice his vision and to be part of the process? Um, so if you look uh, a bit more at the first idea, uh, the distribu distributive um, idea, the distributional theory of social justice, um, the first idea is corrective justice. G uh, going back to a pre-trauma situation, this is the idea of um, the four major transformation of land structure. In this case, is land justice is um, a lens of analysis, but it's also a social movement motto saying that land justice will be uh, the situation where uh, the transformation of settler colonialism on land structure um, uh, will be without consequences. We should go back to the way land was distributed before settler colonialism, before apartheid, before warfare, before land grabbing, and we could also say in Eastern Europe, before collectivization of land, uh, under the, the communist regime. Um, another um, another uh, uh, way to understand distributive justice is um, all the cases of agrarian reforms. All over the, the second part of the 20th century, uh, I, I said in the, at the beginning of the, of the session, a lot of states tried to redistribute land on a more um, equitable basis. Um, for instance, in uh, Brazil, the idea was that in the Nordest region, a lot of peasants were um, without land. And the, uh, at that time, it was a, a military uh, dictatorship um, whose, mo whose motto was um, land without people for people without land. The people without land were the um, landless peasants of Nordest, and the land without people were the Amazonian forest. And the idea was um, to redistribute land to people who did, did not have access to land. Um, a third uh, way to understand distributive justice is actually what we can see in uh, Europe, North America, a more allocative way of understanding this. Um, and this is the idea with, with the suffer I spoke about uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the distribution of land uh, is transformed gradually by the market. People sell land, people, people um, uh, inherit land. And if the state regulates the way the market, the land market uh, uh, works, it can allocate land to people who would merit it, who would need it. Um, if you look at the, 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 the scientific literature analyzi uh, analyzing those situations, uh, it's a literature focusing on the principles of legitimacy um, which are voiced by the, 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 the people. 
For instance, a paper in, in Scotland was about um, well, Scotland uh, lands, uh, farmland is sold to the market. Farmland people inherit land uh, when their fathers and grandfathers die. But what are the principles of legitimacy? Who um, who guides uh, the regulations? And in this matter, um, the the literature identifies three. Um, um, categories of principles of leg legitimacy. The first one is uh, principles regarding the identity of land users, land owners, who is um, um, uh, who, well, who, which profiles of people, um, which people are the most um, legitimate, le legitimate to to um, to be land users. The first, the, the second category is not about identity; it's about teleolo teleology. Um, what is the, the the meaning of using land? What is the the, the, the objective? Um, uh, like, is it um, family farming? Is it corporate farming? Is it organic agriculture? Is it conventional agriculture? The idea that if you uh, or an organic farmer, maybe under some regulations, you should be able to have better access to land. And the third category of principle is um, regarding more um, um, the, the 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 big objective of the of the land dis distribution. Is it to um, uh, to achieve food security? Is it to achieve food sovereignty? Is it to achieve uh, another uh, objective uh, bigger than just uh, farming? So this was the first category of uh, analysis regarding land distribution from a justice issue. The idea that uh, the idea here is to to s to look at how land is distributed between people, between groups of people, and to analyze what which are the feelings of injustice voiced by the people, and do the feeling are about correcting uh, a traumatic situation regarding uh, land structure? Um, is it about uh, starting back from zero and, and to see what will be a fair distribution of land uh, between people? Or is it just to, um, to regulate the, the fluxes of land, uh, the existing fluxes of land uh, through the market? Um, another uh, second box would be uh, the procedural issue. Is the process also fair? Is it inclusive? And if you look uh, at that, the, the literature um, is really focusing on access to information. Uh, if you are wondering, oh, uh, is the process of land distribution inclusive? One first question is, do all the people who wanted to participate in land distribution process were um, no knew that uh, there were such a process, and did they had access to information uh, at the time they had to to participate to the process? And the last one is about recognition, as I said um, a few minutes ago, with the idea that um, you can do something, um, you can do a process which is inclusive, but. Um, if, for instance, um, the, the principles uh, of uh, land distribution do not include the vision of land of a multiple uh, of, of a variety of, of people, actually, it's not really fair because uh, there is a kind of a, an epistemic oppression. Well, um, I spoke the time I had to speak, and um, if I remember what uh, David Flaché said to me. Um, do you have any questions about those maybe boring slides with uh, theoretical uh, notions? Um, or if you have any questions regarding the, the rest of the, of the presentation, I would be glad to, to discuss with you. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. Uh, really interesting, uh, even on a Friday afternoon. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, we do this every week. Um, <laughs> end of December. Um, January? Oh, January too. Yeah, great. Um, anyways, um, yeah, I I was wondering, uh, maybe in the French example or also other other countries, if you know it, um, I've I just know from Germany that the there are like increasing land conflicts of like non-farm usage of farmland. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, like for solar farms and maybe potentially then with like the whole biodiversity issue or like the increasing like financialization of biodiversity mm -hmm. um there might be yeah that like this just will just increase this conflict over the land and i don't know about france but in germany the rents for the land are al already extremely high so basically as a small farmer you have no chance to pay this rent because the yields are just not that high so either you have to be a big farmer that can afford the yield or you have to like get a solar farm mm -hmm. essentially because otherwise you are the, the business model just doesn't work maybe you can t talk a bit about the french context or other context I, I think like s global south wise it is obviously also a big a big problem with like the solar farm uh, conflict yes. Well, um, yes it's 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 a very interesting question actually there are like maybe five factors of um, non-agricultural usage of agricultural land uh, which can uh, be criticized by some um, groups of interest. Uh, you mentioned uh, solar farms, or uh, in French we call it uh, agrivoltaics, and the, the idea that we could combine the production of electricity with an agricultural production um, with some um, architectural form of solar, solar panels, uh, allowing, for instance, the uh, the, the sheep to, to, to graze the land under uh, the solar panels and so on. Uh, I was uh, one month ago in the Poitou region, in the western part of France, and in every commune there is a project of agrivoltaics. Uh, every commune want, wants to have the rent, to get the rent of the, 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 the tax which should be paid, which should be paid by the, the investors. And um, there is a lot of examples of um, agrivoltaics projects uh, which at the end, five years after, only have the production of electricity components and not more the production of agricultural um, products. So um, this is a first uh, factor. The second one... Um, um, the the SAFER, the the institution, the French institution I, I spoke about um, during the, the presentation, are uh, producing a, a study about um, the <laughs> they call it in French uh, consommation masquée de foncier agricole, so it could be masked uh, land take. Um, what is this? It's the fact that uh, some people want to enlarge the garden of their secondary home. Um, they want to have um, uh, a piece of land for their uh, horse or whatever. A lot of people are interested by owning land, farmlands, but for non-agricultural usage. In this case, it's not like this. It's, it's not the same than with the agrivoltaics because there is a, a much higher reversibility of the uh, land use. But uh, that said, uh, the masked uh, land take. Uh, concerns as much land as land take for urbanization every year. So it's quite, an, in France, it's, it's quite a, an important factor of um, uh, this trend. Uh, well, there is also the um, land abandonment. In France it's not such a problem because there is a rural population which is um, uh, high and there is no uh, depopulation uh, trend which is uh, observed, but in Mediterranean uh, Europe and in Eastern Europe, it's much more um, a concern, uh, an issue, a concern for um, poli public policies. So, um, what more? Yes, green grabbing. Um, what is uh, contested as green grabbing is the idea that um, uh, people or investors 
uh, would um, um, take the control of land for um, uh, land compensation, for ecological compensation. Um, even if we don't mm, phrase it as grabbing, um, in France and in other European countries, when you have, for instance, the project of building a highway, and if this highway destroy, I don't know, a protected forest or uh, protected ponds with uh, 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 very rare, rare species, you have to compensate the natural space which has been uh, destroyed. And us usually the most the easiest way is to take farmland and to to build a pond, an artificial pond on it, or to uh, reforest uh, the farmland. So uh, this is also another factor impacting the the, the farmland market, and and the uh, and the trend that way uh, more more and more people are interested in owning la farmland. <laughs> Not only for producing food. And in Germany, it's true that uh, you have the idea of um, uh, biomass energy, um, biomass based energy, which is not the case in France, but um, uh, in, in many countries, um, uh, corn or other products, agricultural products, are used just to produce um, uh, gas, methane, uh, and so on. And in, in Eastern Germany, uh, some colleagues worked on the, the, the impact about the, the land rent, it's true. And about the land rent, actually in France, France is really a communist country, there is a, a, a land rent cap. The, France, the, the, the state administrates the, the level of uh, farmland rent, so um, we do not have that problem. <laughs> And this doesn't clash with the um, pack, the, C uh, the CAP, yeah, CAP. Um, like having a cap on oh. land rent. Uh, like how, which are the mechanisms within mm -hmm. the European policies ah, oui. that uh, like gives, give incentives to or land concentration? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's true that uh, you may not uh, know in detail what the how the CAP works. Um, there are two pillars in the CAP. Maybe you, you heard about it. The first pillar um, uh, concentrates the largest share of subsidies, and um, those subsidies are largely uh, proportional to the surface you you farm. So the more your farm is uh, big the more subsidies you will um, earn. And the second pillar is about more agri-environmental schemes and um, rural development uh, issue, and it's a quite small amount of the money of the, cap of the CAP. Um, so there is a real, really big incentive uh, for that kind of land rush. If you want to, 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 to get more subsidies from the CAP, you just need to become a larger, a larger farm. And, and Moreover, <laughs> there is um, a differentiation between um, the, the, the plant you're growing. If you're growing, for instance, irrigated corn, you earn more uh, for one hectare as if you, you have only grasslands. So there is also an incentive to, to, to go from grasslands, from uh, high carbon storage land uses, to cereals and uh, crops with uh, low carbon storage, for instance, uh, it's, it's one of the consequences. Like everything I know about the European policy on agriculture is like from more an activist perspective rather than uh, like academic. Mm. But as far as I know, uh, like when the policy is designed, they do not really take into account the demand or, in general, the. Um, necessary consumption if we can call it like that but in the end it becomes like a mechanism to protect like the european agriculture um, despite uh, like even food and like mm -hmm. other agricultural products waste like there have been scandals on that in the past mm. um, well yes um if you if you situate the the debate on the global scale, um, as the Swiss agricultural policy, as the U.S. agricultural policy, the the, the CAP is here to um, 
to support the agricultural sector of um, um, of its uh, member states and it's true that there is no no real real incentive to go uh, uh, to uh, to transition towards uh, a more agroecological agriculture the incentives are really uh, uh, small and he, it's more a policy uh, subsidizing <laughs> the largest farms uh, because they are large and not because they employ people because they uh, put um, uh, practice in because they farm uh, the land with agricultural practices or practices uh, favoring the environment quality and actually there there is a, a lot of plat there are a lot of platforms of, of, of NGOs um, trying to uh, decorrelate the subsidies of the CAP and the surface of land farmed by uh, farms until now it was not taken into consideration but in the strategic dialogue uh, about the future of agriculture in the EU. For the first time this year, it's written that maybe uh, we could uh, consider the idea of decorrelating subsidies and the surface of, farm, uh, of farms. But if you do it now, actually, there is no, uh, for instance, co farms in Denmark in three days because the most of, their, um, of what they earn comes from the, the, the CIP subsidies. And you can see sometimes um, um, uh, fields which are only um, uh, uh, which are not uh, uh, which which don't does not appear as uh, in a brilliant um, uh, state and which are not even um, um, uh, oh, uh, processed and so on just because. Uh, the the corn was the, the the cereal was planted just to 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 get to earn the CIP subsidy, not from an economical uh, um, reason, just for a, a monetary vision, short term. Maybe it can be very quick, and you can just say no if you don't know that much about it <laughs> for everyone else. But um, I'm interested to know if you've done any work on how land grabbing or land concentration happens in the context of carbon markets at all, or you know, carbon trading. I, I've seen like some one-off cases of that happening, but I'm wondering if it's more like systemic to the market. Um, yeah. Um, well, there is no. The, the state of the art is not um, uh, well. The, the results are not really uh, sufficient now, to, so that I can say yes, this is the the, the point. But it's a, a concern for a lot of people. Uh, I was speaking with the with some person of the of the suffer uh, last month, and it's one of their concern. They're uh, starting to think about aha, uh -huh, are people going to buy farmland just because they will. Uh, uh, be able to get carbon credits uh, from it, and they are just mm, wondering if if it's going to to have a, an impact about farmland markets. But for now, um, there is no no evidence that there is a, a huge transformation. Um, one lever could be that, uh, for instance, in France, there is a low carbon label uh, which was introduced some years ago to. Um, to give a, um, a framework for our investors and farmers to um, to to edit contract about uh, voluntary compensation of carbon emissions, but there is not a lot of la of, of cases of low carbon labels because um, it's not s such widespread. Well, for, uh, from ho how different countries are you? Because you said you are from Germany, from the Netherlands. I, I didn't ask you before I, I, I spoke <laughs> who, who you were, uh, wh where you were, you were from. Belgium? Ah, Brazil. India, okay. So, El Salvador. Ah, ouais. Bon, también hay un montón de países. <laughs> and, and you are. 
or here in the room or because there is the, the Zoom session because you, you have a lot of colleagues elsewhere in Europe or... Okay. Mm. Okay, but the, you're all of the of the master class here. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> well, if you have any uh, other question, uh, I'm here to answer it. But um, it's Friday. <laughs> it's late, <laughs> and you may want w would like to 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 go back to your um, personal life. <laughs>